one of the teachings that they taught you is that Jesus didn't die on a cross. They taught you that he died on a stake. Now their teachings keep changing. Here's one of their books here. It's called The Harp of God. The Harp of God was put together many years ago by the Watchtower Society. This here is dated 1921. Yes, 1921. This is the Harp of God. It's a Watchtower Bible and Tract Society publication. We'll put it up on the screen so you can see. It says Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, International Bible Students Association, Brooklyn, New York, USA. And it's right here, written by Joseph Franklin Rutherford, second president of the Watchtower Society. In this book, The Harp of God, Jesus Christ is portrayed on a cross. We'll put it on the video so you can see it. He is portrayed on a cross. In this book, The Harp of God, Jesus is portrayed as hanging on the cross. A few pages later, they have something written here at the bottom. It's going to be on the screen too. And it says, when the grand finale is sung and all the harpers of heaven and earth unite in beautiful harmony, blending with the voices of all the creatures perfected and happy, the great ransom sacrifice will be recognized by all as one of the strings of the harp of God that will yield sweet music to every year. Then all can truly sing, in the cross of Christ I glory, towering over the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathered round its head sublime. Watchtower Society teaching and praising the cross in the book, The Harp of God. So they used to teach the cross. Today, they don't teach the cross anymore. We have an issue. I do. Because this is an organization that claims that they have the truth and nobody else had the truth but them, according to them. And uh, they used to teach the cross, and they said the cross was the truth, and now they say the cross is not the truth. In their earlier publications, like their first Bible version, this one here, the 1950 edition, leading all the way up to their 2013 edition, they taught that Jesus Christ was impaled on a torture stake. Well, they've changed that doctrine too. In the new 2013 Jehovah Witness Bible, he's no longer impaled on a torture stake anymore. He's now nailed to a torture stake. So we're dealing with an organization that keeps changing their teachings while claiming each time that what they're teaching is the truth. Well, the truth does not have an expiration date, but clearly the Watchtower truth, quote unquote truth, has an expiration date because today they'll tell you something's true and then they'll come back years later and say we have new truth and teach you something completely different. Well, we're going to get on to how did Jesus die? And folks, I'm letting you know, I saw some, a, a video on YouTube. I grew up listening to a lot of music. I like classical music. I like dubstep. I love uh, EDM and all that. But long before that came along, there was the 80s and the music of the 80s. And some of the groups I listened to in the 80s loved the music, still love the music. One of the people I listened to in the 80s, the music, was Prince. And I saw a video on YouTube where Prince comes out on the stage and in the background on the big screen was the word Staros. And Prince goes on to say this. Staros, by definition, a wooden stake driven in the ground used to cause torture or death. Staros, perhaps someone lied about the way that someone died. Through some research, I learned that Prince had been influenced by the Jehovah's Witnesses as you see here, a picture of him reading the Jehovah's Witness Bible translation. And this is where he was getting his teachings from. The way the Jehovah's Witnesses lure you in is they take someone that doesn't know the Bible. And they're easily able to sway a person that doesn't know the Bible. Because if you don't know the Bible in the first place, if you don't know this King James in the first place, you can easily be tricked by something like the New World Translation.
So the Jehovah's Witness leaders taught Prince that the word staros means a piece of wood that's driven into the ground. But is that really what it means? You see, folks, there's a worldly definition of staros, and then there's a Bible or biblical definition of staros. Well, I decided to do some research to find out what did staros mean? And what did Zylon mean? Because those are two words that they're quick to throw in the faces of their members to say there was no cross, it was a stake, a torture stake, they say. And they say, look, it was a stake, and the proof is in the Greek. No, the word staros, they say it means stake, they say Zylon means stake. Like, okay, let me look into it and see what it really means. One of the places people tend to go to get information these days, sadly, is Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is not always right. But I find something very interesting about this definition of staros. The definition has been changed. Somebody went in and changed it because what it says now is not what it used to say years ago. Look at how many times the word stake appears in a definition now. Even the word impaled is here. And it appears the Jehovah's Witnesses have had a very heavy influence over this change of definition. One of the things that the Jehovah's Witness leaders have been known to do is to claim that they're quoting from scholars, but they will only quote part of what the person says. Anything that that scholar said that does not agree with their teachings, they'll just leave that part out of the quote by putting four dots or three dots within the quote because they know that their members are not going to go and look up the actual quote to find out what the scholar actually said. Their members are simply going to believe what the leaders tell them. Now remember in an earlier video I told you, whenever you see a Jehovah's Witness literature and it claims to quote somebody and it will say blah 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 dot 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 blah 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 blah. I said whenever you see that dot 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 dot, red lights, sirens, buzzers, everything should be going off in your head because I've learned that that dot 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 is put there by the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses in order to cover up something they don't want you to see. So when I looked at this page, we'll put it up there on the screen for you. They have the definition of Staros on there. And I want you to notice that it says Staros. An upright stake dot 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 dot. You see that? Straros, an upright stake, dot, 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 dot. I said, wait a minute. I want to go and look up the book they claim to be quoting and see what the dot, 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 dot is hiding. It says here they're quoting the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, Volume 7. This is what it actually says. Are you ready? Okay. When you go to page 969, as we see here, what is the very first thing that stands out? It says, Staros Cross. In bold letters, it says, Staros, A, the cross and crucifixion in the NT world, the New Testament world, the cross and the crucifixion in bold letters. You mean to tell me the Jehovah's Witness leaders didn't notice that? Instead, they quote number one, Staros and upright stake, dot, dot, dot. And they didn't notice the bold letters saying the cross and crucifixion in the NT world? The sad part about it is they didn't miss it. They just ignored it because it doesn't go along with what they want to believe. So they just went on to the first definition and skipped over the fact that the very first thing that it says in the very dictionary they claim to be quoting from is Staros means cross. Many of you are aware that you can go to a Jehovah's Witness and try to talk to them about the cross and they will argue with you about Staros and the Jehovah's Witness leadership's definition, which is stake. And when you try to show them a book like this theological book, they'll refuse to look at it. 
And when Jehovah's Witnesses refuse to look at the evidence when you try to show it to them, I'm reminded of what it says here in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. The verse goes on to say that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. That is a very serious charge from God. When you are offered knowledge to show you that you're heading the wrong way and you refuse to look at it, God's word is letting you know that for as long as you reject knowledge, he's going to reject you. So if somebody's showing you something you've never seen before, you should at least take a look at it and make sure of all things. Research it. Find out if it's true. What's the harm? Let's look at the rest of the definitions here and find out more. It says, put it on the screen, Staros, an upright stake such as is used in fences or palisades. Number two, Staros, is an instrument of torture for serious offenses. It may be a vertical pointed stake and upright with a cross beam above it or a post with an intersecting beam of equal length. That's a cross, folks. Definition number two, Staros, is an instrument of torture for serious offenses. It may be a vertical pointed stake and upright with a cross beam above it, or a post with an intersecting beam of equal length. That's a cross. Let's continue to read here. The penalty of crucifixion. The Persians seem to have invented this form of execution. Alexander the Great and his successors used it, then the Romans, although not officially for citizens. Josephus mentioned mass crucifixions of rebels in Judea. The condemned person carries the cross beam to the place of execution, is fastened to it with ropes or nails, and then is hoisted on the stake which is already erected. About the middle of the post, a wooden block supports the suspended body. The height of the cross varies. A tablet hung around the victim states the cause of execution, and this is then affixed to the cross. Scourging often precedes crucifixion, and the victim is exposed to mockery. You're made to carry the cross beam to the place you're going to be crucified. Why didn't they tell you that the word staros means cross? Why did they just show you part of the first definition, but not give you the whole definition? This is the book they claim to be quoting from. Let's continue to read. Why not? Let's continue to read and see what it says here. B. Staros. In the NT. Staros. In the New Testament. You ready? Remember, the watchtower said Staros only means stake. According to this, Staros means cross too. But the watchtower didn't want you to know that. They kept that hidden from you. Look at what it says here. Staros. In the New Testament. The cross of Jesus. This is the same book they claim teaches that Straros only means stake. You're seeing now, definition number one, Straros is an upright stake such as used in fences or palisades. Jesus was not building a fence or a palisade. He was being crucified for the sins of the world. So definition number one would not fit. But you notice in the wiki, the watchtower only put in the first part of the definition, Straros is an upright stake, dot, 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 dot. That is deceptive in the highest order by leaving out what Staros really means. It says it so clearly that Staros, an instrument of torture for serious offenses, may be a vertical pointed, by the way, very important. Listen to this about the vertical. Remember they, they, they claim Jesus was hanging on a vertical beam, a vertical stake. A staros vertical stake has a point. It comes to a point. All the pictures that the Watchtower Society shows of the Jehovah's Witness Jesus being impaled on a torture stake or nailed to a torture stake, he is not on a pointed stake. He's usually depicted on a piece of wood that's either round or square with a flat top. If it is a staros stake,
stake, it would come to a point. The Watchtower Jesus is not crucified on that. Their definition is wrong. Their picture is wrong. And we're going to get on that in a moment as well. But you see here clearly, it says Staros. It may be a vertical pointed stake, but that's not how he died. An upright with a cross beam above it, or with a post and intersecting beam of equal length across. They didn't tell their members that Staros also means a cross. And by doing so, their members were misled, sent door to door, telling people that Jesus hung in the wrong way. Prince goes out on his stage. I'm sure innocent, he didn't know. And he presented their viewpoint. Here's another word that the Watchtower uses concerning the death of Jesus Christ. They say, well, the word Zylon. They say Zylon means, uh, you know, wood or, or timber. Well, let's see what Zylon means. Xylon means living or dead wood, anything made of wood, e.g. a stick, cudgel, or club, also a bench or table, as an instrument of punishment and restraint, uh, and it's kind of a wooden collar. Is that how Jesus died? A wooden collar? No. Let's keep looking at the other definitions, like definition number four for Xylon. Put it on the screen. Definition number four for Zylon, the cross. A distinctive use of Zylon in the New Testament is for the cross. The basis is Deuteronomy 21-22, which stresses the shame of being exposed on a tree. Acts 5-30, Acts 10-39, etc. makes the point that the crucifixion is the greatest possible insult to Jesus but that God had displayed his majesty by raising him from the dead. Paul in Galatians 3.13 shows us that Christ has redeemed us from the curse by being made a curse for us according to Deuteronomy 21.22. The curse lies on those who break the law, but Christ, who has not broken the law, voluntarily and vicariously becomes accursed, and his death on the accursed wood makes plain. He thus released us from the curse and from the death that it entails. 1 Peter 2.24 is to the same effect when it says Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree with a plain reference to Isaiah 53, 4 and 12. The vicarious element is prominent here. Human sins are laid on Christ, crucified in him, and thus set aside. Christ does not lay sins on a scapegoat, but takes them on himself and cancels them on the cross. So that sinners dead to sin may live to righteousness. Zylon, definition number four. The cross and points you directly to the New Testament where the term is used referring to the New Testament then shooting you back to the Old Testament to show you how they both intertwine together. Zylon is cross, just like Staros is cross. But the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society didn't tell you. They led you to believe that Zylon and Staros was not a cross. Staros. Koine Greek. In Koine Greek, the form of Greek used between 300 BC and AD 300, the word Shoros was used to denote a structure on which a Roman executes criminals. In the writings of Diodorus Siculus, 1st century BC, Plutarch and Lucian, non-Christian writers, of whom only Lucian makes clear the shape of the device, the word Staros is generally translated as cross. This form of capital punishment involved binding the victim with outstretched arms to a crossbeam or nailing him firmly to it through his wrists. The crossbeam was then raised up against the shaft and made fast to it about three meters from the ground. The feet were tightly bound or nailed to an upright shaft. So my understanding is he would be carrying the crossbeam to the place of crucifixion. Once there, the crossbeam would then be connected to the staros that's already there laying on the ground. 
They would nail his feet to the star roast that's already there. They would then scratch his arms out to the side as far as they can and nail them to the crossbar that he was carrying. Once this is done, then they would use ropes in order to raise the cross up to an upright position. Why didn't they tell you that? You see, Jesus did that for you. He didn't sin. We're the ones who sinned. It was our cross he was carrying. It was your cross he was carrying. Not a stake. Cross. They lied to you. I'm going to show you something else where they lied to you about the cross and the stake. This is the Jehovah's Witnesses Kingdom Interlinear Version. When you go to the back, this is the purple edition for those of you who want to look this up at your kingdom halls. When you go to the back of your Kingdom Interlinear Version, they talk about the stake. And they take a picture. This is page 1156. They claim that this picture, we'll put it up on the screen for you, of a man hanging with both hands over top of his head. They said they got this picture from a book called De Cruz Liber Primus by Justice Lipsius. What they did is this. The pictures you're seeing on your screen are taken from the same book, De Cruz Liber Primus. I want you to notice the pictures of people hanging on various kinds of crosses. The Watchtower leadership ignored all those pictures to focus on the one picture of the man hanging with both hands over top of his head. And what they did is they took that picture, they brought it over into their book, and the Watchtower leaders put their own words to that picture to give you the impression that this is what Justice Lipsius believed, that Jesus died on an upright beam a stake but that's not what Justice Lipsius wrote and that's not what he said when Jesus is often depicted crucified what do you notice usually in the pictures number one you notice it's a cross number two the letters I N R I are usually over top of his head thirdly Oftentimes, there is a glow or a halo around the head to signify that they're talking about Jesus. So why then did the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society ignore this picture from De Cruz Liber Primus? Put it on the screen. Why did they ignore this picture? For those of you who are listening to the audio version of this, the picture depicts the picture we normally see of Jesus on the cross. Hanging on a cross, the letters I-N-R-I above his head, the glow around the head. At the base of the cross is a skull. Why a skull? Because the King James Bible says the place where Jesus was crucified was called Golgotha, and it gives you the definition of Golgotha, the place of the skull. So he puts the skull at the base of the cross, and in the background, you see the city of Jerusalem. Why would the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society tell their members that Jesus Christ was impaled on a torture stake or nailed to a torture stake and try to say that Justice Lipsius in his book agrees with them when he had this picture in his book of how Jesus died on a cross? He goes on to say in his book, in the Lord's cross there were four pieces of wood, the upright beam, the cross beam, a piece of tree trunk below, and the inscription above. Why didn't they mention that to their members and lead their members to falsely believe that Jesus died on a stake? In their book, Reasoning from the Scriptures, I believe it's page 89, put it on the screen. 
They're talking about the cross. They claim to be quoting from the Imperial Bible Dictionary. Remember I told you about the dot, 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 dot? You're about to see it come into play. But they're going to be exposed this time. It says here, the Greek word rendered cross in many modern Bible versions, torture stake in the NW, is staros. In classical Greek, this word meant merely an upright stake or pale. You just saw that that definition they gave is a lie. Later, it also became used as an execution stake having a cross piece. The Imperial Bible Dictionary acknowledges thing, the Greek word for cross, staros, properly signifies a stake or upright pole or piece of paling on which anything might be hung or which might be used for impaling, fencing in a piece of ground, dot, 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 dot. Even amongst the Romans, the crux from which our cross is derived appear to have been originally an upright pole. Is that really what the Imperial Bible Dictionary said? That it wasn't a cross, but it was an upright pole? This is the photocopy from the Imperial Bible Dictionary. Put it on the screen. The part in the yellow is what they have in your reasoning from the scripture book. The part in the purple is what they ignored using dot, 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 dot. So let's take a look at what they ignored with the dot, 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 and we'll read it exactly as it is here. Matter of fact, let me just start right from the top and read it all the way through without stopping. That way you get it in its full context. I'm not trying to hide nothing. It's the watchtower trying to hide stuff. I'm going to bring it out right here, put it up on the screen, let them read along with me. Cross crucify. The Greek word for cross Staros. primarily signified a stake or upright pole or piece of paling on which anything might be hung or which might be used for impaling a piece of ground. But a modification was introduced as a dominion and usage of Rome extended themselves through the Greek-speaking countries. Even amongst the Romans, the crux from which our cross is derived appear to have been originally an upright pole, and this always remained a more prominent part. But from the time that it began to be used as an instrument of punishment, a traverse piece of wood was commonly added. Not, however, always even then. A traverse piece of wood was added when the Romans started using it for punishment. This second section down here says, others extending their ha arms out in a pandabellum. There can be no doubt, however, that the latter sort was the more common and that about the period of the gospel age crucifixion was usually accomplished by suspending a criminal on a cross piece of wood. The Imperial Bible Dictionary says criminals during that time was crucified on a cross that had a traverse beam, cross beam. This is what I mean when I say when the Watchtower Society claims to quote somebody and they put dot, 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 you know they're hiding something. So for all the definitions for Staros, they say it's just a stake. When you read the full definition, it says it's a cross. When you see Xylon, they say it's just a timber or a tree. When you read the full definition, they say when it's talking about the Bible, the New Testament, it's a cross. But they didn't tell you that. They didn't tell you that. They claim to quote from Justice Lipsius's book. They take a picture out of his book, they put their own words to it, and they leave you to think that this is what Justice Lipsius believes when it's not what he believes at all, and they ignore the picture of the man on the cross that's in Justice Lipsius's book. They ignore the picture 
the uh, inscription above his head, the skull at the base of the cross, and Jerusalem in the background, and they ignored the fact that just as Lipsius said, in the Lord's cross there were four pieces of wood, the upright beam, the cross beam, a piece of tree trunk below, and the inscription above. So they misled you. They lied to you. They lied to you about how Jesus died. They sent you door to door to tell others the lie. I don't think that you intentionally mean to lie to anybody. I think you joined the group because you thought you were joining the truth. But I think you're learning through this video series that they're not telling you the truth. There's only one place on this earth you're going to find the truth. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is called in the book of John and in the book of Revelation. He is called the Word of of God. Guess what the Word of God is? It's the Bible. But not just any Bible. My King James Bible tells me that God said that the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God said his words are pure words and that he would preserve those words. Here's the preserved words in our language. In the second chapter of Acts, the Holy Spirit of God showed that he was more than able to take God's holy word and translate it into at least 13 languages just like that. It was accurately translated to the point where the people on the street hearing these men come out of this upper room, they came down and began preaching to these people in their own native language. Five minutes earlier, they couldn't speak those languages, but the Holy Spirit empowered those men that they were able to go down and speak to those people in those people's own languages and in the second chapter of Acts it gives you a list of all these different nations and languages and they were able to speak those languages just like that with the power of God's Holy Spirit if he can translate his word from the original language to their languages accurately he was able to translate it from the original languages to English and he did. And he did it in a time before the politically correct movement, before the feminist movement, before the sodomy movement, before all of these strange movements that are moving through the world these days. In 1611, they didn't have all that stuff going on. He gave us a pure, holy Bible. A pure, holy Bible. And he wants us to read it. And he wants us to believe it. You can trace this Bible back to the Tyndale Bible, the Coverdale Bible, the Bishop's Bible, right on back to the original manuscripts. But I just wanted to touch base with you on that and let you know they didn't tell you the truth when they said Jesus Christ was impaled on a torture stake or nailed to a torture stake and they denied the cross. I wanted to show, you know, show you the facts of how Jesus actually died. It's really simple, guys. The Romans killed him. To this day, the Romans still show you how they killed the Son of God, and you never ever see a Roman Catholic walking around with a man with both hands over top of his head because they know that's not how they killed him. They know he was crucified on the cross because they're the ones that crucified him on the cross. Okay. Staro means cross as you saw. Xylon means cross like you saw. Justice Lipsius did not say Jesus was impaled on a torture stake. As the Watchtower says, you saw right from his own publications where he portrayed Jesus on a cross. On your screen right now is a copy of the 1950 edition of the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation. Most Jehovah's Witnesses today have never seen it, they've never read it, and they're not familiar with it. So I want to bring to your attention what they have here. In the back of this Bible version, it's only a New Testament for this 1950 edition, they have a section called the Appendix. And this Appendix appears to be designed for the purpose of explaining why it is that the Jehovah's Witness religion classifies itself as Christian while at the same time rejecting basic Christian doctrines such as 
the cross. So they put the appendix here as a way of trying to explain away why they don't believe that Jesus is God and why they don't believe in the cross and why they don't believe in hell and various other things that has been taught in Christianity for nearly 2,000 years. The question is, do they have any support for their teaching that Jesus died on a stake? Take a look at what they wrote here on page 771. For the past few pages, beginning at page 768, going all the way to page 772, they're trying to explain why they're using stake rather than cross. Let's read what they say here on page 771. Based upon all the things you've just learned in this video, listen to what they say here. It says, the evidence is therefore completely lacking that Jesus Christ was crucified on two pieces of timber placed at a right angle. We refuse to add anything to God's written word by inserting the pagan cross into the inspired scriptures, but render Staros and Zylon according to the simplest meanings. Since Jesus used Staros to represent the suffering and shame or torture of his followers, Matthew 16, 24, we have translated Staros as torture stake to distinguish it from Zylon, which we have translated stake, or in the footnote, tree, as in Acts 5, 30. Listen what they're going to say next. This is a revolutionary translation, we admit, but it is the purest one. The passing of time and further archaeological discoveries will be certain to prove its correctness. Even now, the burden rests upon all who contend for the religious tradition to prove that Jesus died on more than a simple stake. I'm sorry, Watchtower, but that is not how arguments work. The Watchtower Society is admitting here they don't have any real proof that Jesus died on a stake. They're saying they hope that archaeologists and others will eventually come up with proof to prove them right. Then they say they want Christians to try to prove that Jesus did die on a cross. No, 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 that's not how it works. If they're going to say that Jesus didn't die on the cross, it's up to them to find real proof. And based upon what you just heard in this video, they don't have any real proof that Jesus didn't die on the cross because all the evidence says that he did. The ones that say that he didn't die on the cross is the Watchtower. The word revolutionary, Watchtower said that their translation, rather than saying cross, saying stake, they said that it's a revolutionary translation. Well, let's see what the definition of revolutionary means. Definition number 1A, of relating to or constituting a revolution. Letter B, tending to or promoting revolution. Letter C, constituting or bringing about a major or fundamental change. You see, they started off with the King James Bible, but the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses did not like what God's holy word said. So in 1950, by their own admission, they decided to abandon God's word and write their own Bible version that would say what they agreed with. So they call it a revolutionary translation. Let's take a look at another dictionary, just to make sure we're on the same boat here. This is dictionary.com. Revolutionary. It says, of pertaining to, characterized by, or of the nature of a revolution, or a sudden, complete, or marked change. Number two. Radically new or innovative, outside or beyond established procedure, principles, etc. So what the Watchtower is trying to do with their translation, by instead of using cross, using stake, by identifying Jesus as a God rather than God, taking out hell and all of these things, what they've done by their own admission was produce a revolutionary 
translation that would attack the fundamentals of the Christian faith. While claiming to be a Christian religion, their number one enemy is what they call Christendom, which is fundamental Bible-believing Christianity mainly. That's what it appears to be to me. There is no reason for them to have removed the cross from the Bible except for the fact that the leadership of their group didn't like what God's holy word, the King James Bible, had to say. Now, can you really trust what these men are teaching you? I want to show you one last thing before we end the video. If I was to ask you, where do your teachings come from? You would say the Bible. That's where most Jehovah's Witnesses think their teachings are coming from. They think it's coming from the Bible. Well, what does the leadership of your group have to say? In 1959, they came out with a Watchtower magazine on your screen. 1959, November 1st. This is what it had to say in the section called Questions from Readers. Listen very closely. It's going to be on your screen. The question from reader was, is it true that the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses are based on the New World Translation of the Bible? This is their answer. The fact that the New World Translation bears out teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses does not prove that the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses are founded upon this Bible translation. Since 1879, the Watchtower has been published, setting forth the things that Jehovah's Witnesses believe and teach. Wait a minute. So they're admitting that their teachings don't come from the Bible. Their teachings come from the Watchtower. Who puts the Watchtower together? Let's see what else they say here. The New World Translation, which the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has accepted as a gift from the New World Bible Translation Committee, first began to be published in part in 1950, and volumes of it have been coming out from time to time since then. Consequently, the formulation of the Bible Doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses did not wait upon the New World Translation, beginning in 1950. Up until 1950, the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses were based mainly upon the King James Version of the Bible. Wait a minute. Is that right? Up until 1950, their teachings were based upon the King James. What does the King James Bible teach? The King James Bible teaches that Jesus is God. The King James Bible teaches that God is is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The King James Bible teaches that Jesus died on the cross. The King James Bible teaches that there is a hell. The King James Bible teaches that people have a soul. The King James Bible teaches that you are saved, your sins are forgiven, by the grace of God and not by trying to earn it by going door to door and doing things for a religious organization. It is a gift of God and not by works. So they used to use the King James, but they didn't like the King James because the King James Bible was teaching things that the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses did not agree with. So they decided they were going to write their own Bible version. It says here, up until 1950, the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses were based mainly upon the King James Version of the Bible. What happened in 1950? They wrote their own Bible version to make it say what they wanted it to say. That's what happened. It says here, up until 1950, the teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses were based mainly upon the King James Version of the Bible. But in the course of years, the publications of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in English alone have quoted from more than 70 different Bible translations produced in Christendom. So while they attack Christendom, they're using 70 different versions of Christendom Bible versions to come up with their teachings? Because they're saying the New World Translation is not their source for their teachings, so if the 70 plus different altered Bible versions that I've preached against for more than 30 years, what they're getting their teachings from? It says here, 
These does not take into account the fact that our literature is published in more than 125 languages and that these foreign languages do not have the English New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. In all parts of the world, Jehovah's Witnesses are proving their Bible-based beliefs. Wait a minute. They just said their beliefs are not based on the Bible. Isn't that where they just started off saying that their teachings were not based on the Bible? Let's go back to that first paragraph. The fact that the New World Translation bears out teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses does not prove that the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses are founded upon this Bible translation. So what Bible are they basing their teachings on? None. They just told you that since 1879 they've had the Watchtower magazine as their source of authority to teach you your beliefs and teachings, not the Bible. But who puts together the Watchtower magazine? A group of men who call themselves a channel. They call themselves Jehovah's channel. But when I read my King James Bible, I don't read that the God of heaven uses channels. It says here in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. No mention of giving us channels. Even in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, not by a channel. Channeling is of the occult. There's no way you're going to Christianize a channel. The leaders of your group are telling you who they are, and they're telling you what they are. And since they're showing you now that their final authority is not the Bible, then this organization is not a Christian religion, no matter what they say. God doesn't use channels. Satan does. Let's continue to read. This does not take into the account the fact that our literature is published in more than 125 languages and that these foreign languages do not have the English New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. In all parts of the world, Jehovah's Witnesses are proving their Bible-based beliefs to the people by the copy of the Bible that that householder may have or that he may recognize as authority. So the New World Translation comes along merely as a confirmation of the correctness of the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses and does not constitute the foundation of their teachings. So by the Jehovah's Witness leaders own admission the Bible is not their final authority. Not even their Bible is their final authority. Their final authority is the Watchtower. But who writes the Watchtower? A group of men who have rejected God's holy word in English, the King James Bible, and has decided to replace it with their own beliefs, their own teachings, their own desires, their own custom-made Bible translation that they themselves admit they don't even adhere to. They adhere instead to the watchtower. The question is, where do they get the information that appears in a watchtower magazine? Because the watchtower magazine has had a long history of getting things wrong. They have placed the words and beliefs and teachings of a group of men over the authority of the Word of God. They abandoned the Word of God in 1950 when they turned their back on the King James Bible and decided to write their own Bible version. And since 1950, they've had, what, three or four different Bible versions, all of which they claim is the most accurate translation? 
yet they admit their Bible is not even their source of authority. So how can you trust what this religion is teaching you, knowing that the Bible version you have right now is only as good as when they finally decide to change it to something else? When you could have the Word of God that has been the Word of God in English for over 400 years, a trustworthy, unchanging book, the King James Bible. Don't be fooled by counterfeits like the so-called New King James. If it's not the authorized King James Bible, it's not the real thing. Stick with the good old-fashioned authorized King James Bible and you can't go wrong. So I just wanted to bring that information to you and I'm going to close it off this video segment by letting you know the hope that I have. You as a Jehovah's Witness, if you'll be honest with yourself, you're in a religion that gives you no hope. They tell you that if you work hard enough for the organization and if you're obedient enough that maybe, maybe you might be found good enough to make it to paradise or maybe. They say you're certainly not going to make it to heaven. They say that's only 444,000, but they say you got to be like really faithful and be going to all the meetings and all this stuff if you're going to make it. And maybe you'll make it. And I have talked with Jehovah's Witness elders who had been in the organization. One told me over 50 years. And I asked them, I can ask them, if you were to die right now after over 50 years in this organization, doing everything they told you to do, if you were to die today, do you make it or do you not make it? And the answer is always the same. They always say, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I want to let you know something. The God of your New World Translation will leave you wondering, are you ever good enough? You'll never be good enough for the God of this book because he's not the real God. The God of my book the King James Bible lets you know number one you don't have to earn his favor he's a loving father you don't have to earn your father's favor I stand on this verse till the day I die 1st John chapter 5 verse 13 the Watchtower Society tell you you're supposed to believe on the name of Jehovah it's not what the Bible tells you the Bible tells you to believe on the name of Jesus Christ Let's see what it says here. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I believe on the name of the Son of God. I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. I couldn't earn it. There's nothing I can do to improve on what he did on that cross. It was not a stake. It was a cross. And he bore that for me he died for the sins that I've done he died for the sins that you did whether you accept him or you don't accept him he died on that cross for you and he did it for me all he asks us to do is to accept what he did if you don't accept it when you die you will face him and he will have no choice but to sentence you to hell I know you don't believe in hell the Bible says that God would that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He doesn't take pleasure in throwing people into hell. So he took the time to come to this earth, live out a human life for 33 years, to show us how to live, to show us his ways, and then to allow himself to be put to death in a human body in the most humiliating of ways, paraded down the street, beaten up, whipped, crown of thorns on his head, spat upon, cursed at, and then stripped naked and hung on a cross. Remember, they took lots for his clothes, hung naked on the cross. God, the creator of the universe, hanging naked on a cross outside Jerusalem, dying for the sins of a world that cursed him and hated him and would not acknowledge that he was God. But he did it because he loves you. I want to give you the hope that I have. 
I didn't have to earn my way to his favor. I just simply said, I believe. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. And I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins. And he did. And because he freed me from the curse of sin, I still sin, I'm a sinner. But I'm clean. He purified me. He'll do the same for you. I can't earn my way to heaven because I can't be good. None of us can be good. It's not in us to be good. Not by his qualifications of being good. Just read the Ten Commandments and see how many of them you broke. It's not in us to be good. He did the work for us. He cleans us up through Jesus Christ. And he just asks us to believe on him. Didn't ask you to work for it. Didn't ask you to earn it. He asked you to believe. So if you're a Jehovah Witness and you just watched this video and you've seen where the Watchtower Society has misled you about the cross of Christ, they lied to you about his cross, you need to come out of there. I know they make it really hard for you to come out. If you have a family, you need to have your family sit back and watch the Hidden from Jehovah's Witness video series. Watch it. Just, just watch it. Just watch it with them. That way you can all come out together. Be freed from that organization that continues to mislead you and get your entire family the authorized King James Bible. Start in the New Testament and start reading. Learn who Jesus really is. Learn what he did for you. Learn how to live a proper Christian life, not the kind of life that they taught you to live. This is the book that will clean you up. Pick it up. Read it. And everywhere in this King James Bible where it contradicts what they've told you, let God be true and let every man be a liar. Let God be true and every man be a liar.